Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the organizers. It's a real pleasure to be here this week. Um, and it's also a real pleasure to show you some of the work that I've been doing uh, over the past few years. Most of this will be work that I've done at Carnegie Mellon University and I just moved to, to Berkeley. So today I thought I would, I, I had this very unspecific title because I thought I would uh, give you some, of my, some feedback of uh, some applications that I've played with of deep learning in cosmology and try to show you what I think are the promises of these approaches and where the challenge might be. So before diving too much uh, into the machine learning aspect of things, uh, I want to put things into perspective. So most of us here are working uh, either already in a survey or towards a next generation survey, and my specific survey is the LSST. I'm part of the Dark Energy Science Collaboration. So for those of you who might not know, the LSST is essentially a giant robot telescope is going to observe the full sky once every three uh, days, uh, more or less. And if you look in terms of numbers, um, every night you will get something like 15 terabytes of data. So that's uh, image level um, image level data that needs to be processed uh, at this huge rate every night uh, over a period of 10 years to do our cosmology. Um, so that's a lot of numbers, but I'll try to put this into a more visual representation. This is a map of the, the wide survey uh, of LSST uh, in blue. And the tiny patch that you see here is just one force of one exposure of LSST. So if I zoom onto this image, uh, I get something like this. I can start to see some sources. And from where you stand, you actually do not see any galaxies here. It's only stars from our own uh, Milky Way. So you need to zoom in again, uh, and you start to see the actual you know, source of the signal and the data we are going to play with, uh, the actual galaxies. So when you take this, this uh, view and you zoom back, you get a sense of the scale of the data that we have uh, to process. So it's not only a huge amount of data, it's also a huge amount of extremely high quality data. So here is an illustration of this uh, with HSC, which is essentially a proxy for what uh, LSST will look like as a current generation survey. And this is SDSS, a previous generation survey, imaging survey. And so you may not be able to see this very well on this screen, but HSC has much finer resolution and much greater depth. So you see a lot more objects here. You have a lot more uh, things going on. And it may not be obvious by looking at this, but in fact, um, and probably Peter will tell us more about this, uh, processing these images is incredibly more complicated than uh, the lower resolution surveys. So as your data gain in complexity, making sense of all of this data is also a challenge in itself. All right, so why do I mention all of this? Um, it's try, it's to, to highlight, the highlight the fact that um, modern surveys will give us a huge amount of high quality data. On the one hand, it's really a blessing for us because it means we'll have unprecedented, unprecedented statistical power uh, and that gives, gives us a great potential for new discoveries, wherever they might be. Uh, but when you look at this uh, in details, and those of you who are in the implementation of current surveys know this very well, it can also turn out to be a, a curse, because all of the methods that you already know, that you've developed over the last decades or so, uh, start to fail one after the other uh, when you apply to that scale and that complexity of the data. Uh, and one thing that is uh, paramount in all of our endeavors is the control of systematic uncertainties. And uh, that's the main challenge going forward. All right, so here I want to argue that uh, we have a dire need for novel data analysis techniques. So we've heard about uh, new ways of doing inference this week, uh, but it goes beyond that. And I will argue that it goes to all the levels, uh, all the levels of the data analysis pipeline. So I want to show you a few examples of, of uh, this. Um, and I've picked three or four uh, examples here. And I want to start with something very simple to uh, put the basics of what uh, deep learning is with a, uh, I'd say a very visual application and something that uh, can be easily understood. Um, all right, so the first thing that I want to show you is this, this problem where uh, we're trying to find those uh, gravitational lenses. Uh, so galaxy scale, strong gravitational lenses, where you have a strong, uh, like a massive galaxy in the foreground, and you have a background galaxy right behind it. And when you are in this kind of situation, uh, the, the light from the background galaxy gets uh, distorted, and you, in extreme uh, situations, you have formations of multiple images, and I stand like this. 
So the problem with these objects, they are very interesting for multiple reasons, but they are also extremely rare. So this is a full set uh, from the, the Slack survey um, of the, the lenses that they were able to find at the time. The point here is that uh, it's a big survey and that's all the lenses they could find. So nowadays, uh, we only have in the hundreds of known lenses uh, of this type. So why are we interested in these objects in the first place? Uh, there are several multiple reasons, but one of them uh, can be a great national time delay. So here is just an illustration of this. If you have a lens here, uh, which is lensing a, a background objects, uh, and if the, lens, if the background object is right behind the lens, you have the formation of multiple objects. And the time that the light will take to reach us from the multiple objects will depend on the geometry of the system. Uh, here, this uh, depends on the geometry, on the potential of the lens, and on a factor here that depends on the Hubble parameter. So the point here is that if you can measure the system well enough, if you can measure these time delays, you get uh, constraints on the Hubble parameters. That's one example applications. So now the problem is, I know these objects are interesting, but how can I find them efficiently? So as I said, we are moving towards extreme volumes of data. So we need something very efficient at this task. So here, there is a gravitational lens in this image. Can people spot it? It's it's a very easy case, yes, perfect. Uh, yes, it's here. It's a beautiful one, and that's a tiny patch of the sky. And the fact that it doesn't jump uh, to everybody uh, is just an illustration of how hard this problem is. So people, I, I've been looking at these kind of problems, and I've come up with different kinds of algorithms to try and find, uh, you know, efficiently candidates for those lenses. So one previous generation of algorithm that I like uh, a lot is, is this ring finder uh, made by uh, Gapati and Dal a few years ago. And the idea there was to use your astrophysical knowledge of what um, uh, a, a, a gravitational lens system should look like. And in particular, you want to use the knowledge that the, the, the color of the background lens and the color of the, the, foreground, the, the background object, sorry, uh, are different. And so the idea here was, okay, I'm going to try to subtract uh, the lens because I know uh, that its color is different from the background. And if I see any residual lights uh, around this, it's an indication that there might be uh, something else. It could be a lens object. So here is an illustration of this. This is the image. Here is a combination of different bands uh, in a way that it tries to remove uh, the light from, from the lens. And if you have any uh, surplus of light here, it gets detected by the algorithm and the algorithm flags this as a potential candidate. So here in this particular case, this is uh, a space-based uh, confirmation of this. This is actually a real lens. But in other situations, uh, the algorithm will give you the same thing, but it turns out to be just um, some uh, star forming regions inside, inside the host galaxy. So the idea here is that uh, it was one of the most, uh, you know, uh, one of the best method at the time to do this task, and it still required something like 30 person minutes per square arc degrees uh, of actual humans looking at all these images to try to sort out the false detections from the real ones. So if you look at how that would uh, scale for a survey like LSST, uh, you get uh, something like that. So here is um, the number of strong lenses that we know of in CFHT lens, so previous generation survey. This is the S, uh, current generation, so this is the expected number of lenses. And this is LSST. Uh, every time you get something like one order of magnitude. And you can also uh, put next to this the number of man hours that you would require to sort through all the false positives from an algorithm like this. And what you can quickly see is that this is not realistic. Uh, for a survey like LSST, uh, you would need something like 10 to the 4 uh, man hours. Um, all right, so how can we robustly detect these rare objects at the scale of our next generation of survey without needing an army of potentially grad students? So obviously, because uh, we've heard about deep learning already in this session, one solution uh, would be to use automated techniques such as deep convolutional networks. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I assume that most of you already know these type of networks. The idea is that uh, you take an image at the input, you apply a set of filters, convolutional filters to these images, and you extract what we call feature maps. 
And you do this multiple times. And as you go deeper and deeper in the network, you're building higher and higher level representations of your data to the point where at the last layers of the, the model, you're able to easily discriminate between different types of uh, signals. Um, all right, so when these methods first came out uh, in something like 2018, 2012, uh, they blew out of the water all the previous methods that have been developed for the past uh, decades or so. So that's in 2012. This is uh, a, an image, a classic uh, image classification challenge. Um, a few years later, uh, a new method came out and got even better results. And here you can see the depths of the network. So it says as you add layers, you get better results in your, in your classification. Uh, and all the way to 2015, and now it's, it's, some, it's almost the best one can do. Uh, you can all get even better results by going to a depth like uh, 150 layers. So the problem, the reason why people were not going to these depths before is that a simple uh, method, a simple network architecture like this uh, cannot train to this kind of depth. So you, people had to come up with some kind of tricks. So the trick, the particular trick that uh, was used in that, in that situation uh, is called uh, residual learning, where instead of stacking your convolution layers uh, on one column like this, you introduce residual connections, skipping some of the, some, some of the uh, convolution layers. And that can, may seem like a very trivial change to your architecture, but by doing that, you allow the information to flow without uh, any hindrance from the input to the output. And you can use this to train very, very deep networks down to uh, something like a thousand layers. And the idea is that as you add layers, you add to the complexity of the model and you add in um, e uh, efficiency. So we use this idea. Uh, we build this, this deep neural network back in 2017. Here you have your image at the input, and each of these blocks here is one unit of these uh, residual uh, blocks. Overall, we have something like 40 different layers, uh, 46 different layers. We train this on images that we simulate at LSST resolution and depths. So we, we train for a range of sizes uh, of lenses, of, of uh, and, you know, lens parameters, and for different uh, levels of noise. And we're able, once the, the training is done, we're able to classify this kind of images extremely, extremely fast on modern GPUs. So that means that you can actually scale these methods uh, all the way to next generation of surveys. All right. So to show you that it works uh, pretty well, we entered this method in the, um, the Euclid Strong Lensing Challenge that happened last year and that was published this year where the challenge was given a set of uh, ground-based simulations that look like this, or space-based simulations looking like this. Uh, the pe people were tasked with identifying which you know, postage stamps contain actual uh, strong lenses and which one uh, do not. I won't go into to all the details of all the results of this challenge, but I will show you this plot, uh, which compares our method to uh, this other team from Manchester. So to understand this plot, you have here the, the false positive rate, so how, many, how much time you make false positives, and here the true positive rate. So to get the better, uh, the better results would be to have a curve that gets you closer to that corner. So just by eye, you can see that this algorithm is doing better than this, uh, this one. So what, uh, what is interesting here is that this Manchester submission actually used uh, real humans looking at images. Um, so something like 100,000 images. So it shows you that a completely automated uh, algorithm can beat uh, actual almost expert human looking at all these images and getting better accuracy. Significantly outperforming uh, human classifications. All right, so I showed you this example as a first example of why I think deep learning can be interesting for a next generation of surveys. It allows us to handle the huge volumes and data rates that we have to, to deal with. Um, at the end of the day, that means that we'll be able to extract larger and more robust samples for doing uh, our science. And as we have heard also uh, this week, and maybe some of you are already aware of this very well, um, this is not the only application of this kind of deep learning networks uh, at you know, image or entry level uh, data. 
Uh, I want to mention photometric time series classification for something like the plastic challenge, but also for the blending or other things that happen at the very input of the pipeline uh, at the image level. All right, so with this example, I showed you that you can use deep neural network to perform very complex tasks. Uh, that particular task was extracting or finding uh, complex objects such as gravitational lenses. So then uh, the question might be, can we use deep neural networks to do something a little bit more complicated? So instead of just doing classification, can we use them to do uh, inference in a principled way? So as a motivating example, I will show you uh, this problem of uh, extracting cosmological information from gravitational mass maps. So this is an example of uh, a convergence map simulated for the DES-SV data. You know that in these convergence maps, uh, there is a lot of information going beyond just the two-point function. So we know that there is information to capture beyond um, the power spectrum. Now the question is, how do we build uh, an optimal statistic to capture this information? And how do we use it to do inference with it? So people have looked at this problem uh, a while back, and this is an example of, uh, of a possible method that was published by people from CEA a few years back. Um, and they looked at different summary statistics that you can compute on these convergence maps to try to extract cosmological information. So the best summary statistic that they could come up at the time was called wavelet peak counting. So you compute a wavelet decomposition of your convergence map here, and you look at the histograms of the wavelet coefficients, and you will see that depending on the cosmology, uh, you get different histograms. So you, you can see that this statistics is sensitive to cosmology. Um, and in that particular example on DES, uh, the ES, in this paper, we looked at the application of one particular um, mass mapping techniques that allows you to extract uh, better than normal techniques uh, the peaks in the spirit that this can be used for this kind of purposes. Um, but this was, uh, you know, almost ad hoc. So another question that uh, I could uh, want to ask is, instead of coming myself uh, with uh, my summary statistic, can, can I just ask a deep neural network to look at my cart, at my, at my map, and infer uh, constraints on sigma 8 and omega m just by uh, looking at the raw convergence maps? So, um, this can, be, this can seem a bit bold uh, of a question, but I'll try to rephrase it uh, in a way that should please all the Bayesians in the room. Um, okay, so let's look at this problem this way. I will give myself just a forward uh, model of my observations. So I assume that my observations x are generated according to this model with some underlying parameter theta and some uh, distribution x given theta. All I ask here is to be able to sample from my, mo from my model uh, in order to build this data set where for each uh, theta I have a corresponding x sample uh, according to this uh, relationship. All right. So now I'm going to assume that I have uh, what I'm going to call a parametric con conditional density, uh, q uh, phi. So it's a, it's a density function that depends on some parameters phi. Um, and that is flexible and can be uh, changed to, to match different distributions. All right, so given those two assumptions, now I can try to do something like this. I can try to optimize the parameters of my density uh, so that I, ma I maximize this, uh, this cost function for all the, the samples in my training set. And so in the limit of infinite samples and sufficient flexibility of of your density functions here, you can show that you can match as well as you want uh, this conditional density estimator to this function. And this function is actually just uh, the posterior of the problem. All right, so I can phrase it this way. Uh, one can asymptotically recover the posterior by optimizing a parametric estimator over the Bayesian joint distribution. But I can also rewrite it that way. Um, one can recover the same thing by optimizing a deep neural network, which will be here my, my Q phi, over a simulating training set that is uh, sampled from, from my model for the signal. And, and that is uh, all there is to it. So uh, the first question is, how do I do this, this parametric estimation, uh, density estimation? So there are a few techniques to do this, uh, and that's actually a very active field in deep learning these days. 
But the most, uh, the simplest one to understand actually dates back from several decades ago. Uh, it's called mixture density networks. So in a mixture density network, uh, you model your distribution P as a mixture of simpler distributions. Uh, and in this case, a, a mixture of Gaussians. And I can assume that uh, the mean of my Gaussians and the standard deviations of my Gaussians or the full covariance of my Gaussians are functions, parametric functions, uh, that takes the, the input uh, as an input and can be tuned to model any distribution that I want. Uh, so here is an illustration of what this looks like. You have uh, X uh, that goes inside a neural network and the neural networks will um, guess the parameters of this mixture model in order to represent this uh, distribution uh, P. So this is the simplest one and it was it's already used, uh, for instance, in the paper that Justin had at the beginning of the year, which is based on, on this other paper you can look into. Um, and it works well when you are limited to a fairly small number of dimensions. When you go to a higher level of uh, higher number of dimensions of your density that you're trying to estimate, and when the density has a more complex structure, you might want to look into these other types of methods that are being developed right now. Like if you are interested in this, I, just ask me afterwards. Um, all right, so now the problem is uh, this is nice, but it usually doesn't work, or it classically doesn't work because conditional density estimators were usually plagued by um, high dimension uh, problems. Um, so you, the problem is I cannot just feed my entire map to my conditional density estimator. It will not be able to, to do a good job at this. And so the classical approach is to try to extract some summary statistic that should uh, gather as much of the signal of interest as possible, uh, but reducing the dimensionality of the, the signal. So people have looked at this problem and I've suggested using neural networks to try to extract the summary statistics. Uh, much lower dimensions that you can optimize on your problem. So the, the first class of method that I want to mention, uh, such as Gupta et al. 2018, but actually Shelley uh, had a paper even before that with the same approach, uh, is to train a neural network in a regression setting. So you, you show it the map and you ask it, uh, okay, give me the sigma eight omega m uh, that correspond to this. And then when you show it a new map, it can do something like this. So the, the yellow points are predictions by a neural network, and you get a point prediction. So for every true sigma h, you get a predicted sigma h. So you can see that there are several problems with this. First, it's not necessarily constrained to be unbiased, um, and you don't also really well, very well understand the distribution of those, uh, of those summary statistics. So it's difficult to do inference with this. Um, it's also not necessarily optimal for the inference task. It doesn't uh, have any notion of uh, minimum variance, for instance. So uh, I want to argue a better method was proposed by uh, Tom, and we'll probably hear more about this uh, later this week. Um, instead of just optimizing for regression, you can try to optimize to try it on, on an information criteria to try to get the best possible summary statistic that you can use for inference. And I won't go into too much detail because we'll hear more about this later. One problem, though, um, is that in order to do this, you need to be able to take numerical derivatives of your simulation with respect to your parameters, and that can be tricky um, if you do not have access to the inside of your model. It can be noisy, let's say. And the, pro the, the last approach that we want to propose here is that instead of uh, using these methods, why not just build a big enough neural network that it can actually just look at the data itself uh, figure out implicitly inside the network the best summary statistic that it needs in order to do uh, this posterior estimation task. And essentially we can do this by just coupling a deep residual network just like the one that we used uh, on, uh, for finding strong lenses, but at the end of the network, instead of having uh, just a classification layer, we have a mixture density output and we train the network to, to maximize um, uh, the likelihood. And this is nice because that means you can do density estimation in very high dimensions and so potentially on the entire maps themselves. All right. So with this approach, you can just throw a map at the network and it will give you a posterior. So the, the problem with this though is that you don't know how do you qualify how well your network is doing in this problem. You don't know the real posterior. Uh, you have no way of testing uh, against a known truth. 
So one way you can go about this is by trying to do some calibration tests. So for instance, this method that was proposed this year uh, based on simulations. And the idea is that if I draw some samples from, uh, from my, my distribution here, so here uh, x tilde and theta tilde are samples from, from those distributions, and I get a posterior from my network from these samples, and I average um, those posteriors under those samples here, in principle, I should go back to uh, my prior for these parameters. And this you can test. This you can just uh, check on simulations. Um, so I will show you an example of this, a visual example of this. Um, if you, you build this rank statistics from those simulations, and if you look at the histograms of this rank statistics, if you had a perfect, perfectly calibrated uh, estimation of your posterior, which you don't, you don't know what is the real value for it, but it doesn't matter, it should be a flat uh, histogram here. If it's not flat, it means that your estimation for the posterior is biased in some sense. So here is what happens if you are getting a broader posterior than what you, you should get. Uh, here is what happens when you get actually a tighter posterior than what uh, it should be. And you get something like this if you have a huge uh, bias in your posterior estimate. So what is interesting here is that although I have no way of knowing what the real posterior should be, I can still test that my method is not uh, giving me biased uh, outputs. All right, so we are testing this on uh, simulations of convergence maps. And for this, we're using the Camelus package that was developed by uh, Tianlin at CEA a few years ago. The idea of this package is to have an extremely fast emulator for convergence maps. So instead of going to a full simulation for, for the signal, um, it's an, an emulator based on very simple principles. So it first samples um, a set of halos from a given mass function. It assigns those halos uh, in 3D space uh, almost um, randomly. And then it draws uh, the lensing from it. It can add noise um, and any uh, survey effects that you want to add. So as an example of survey effects, you can have uh, masks. So here are masks that are drawn from a distribution that are supposed, su supposed to mimic uh, CFHT. And the data that we're looking at is just the raw convergence map reconstructed uh, from the noisy measurements. So we are not doing anything clever. We are not doing any um, um, filtering or anything else. This is our raw data. And we task the network with extracting all the information it needs in order to do the inference. So here are some uh, results of, of this. Uh, here is the fiducial value for the cosmology that we are looking at. This is our posterior. We're inside the one sigma region. And here is the more interesting plots. You can see that uh, with this simple approach, you can uh, get an almost uh, good quality posterior. So we're still working on improving that. But it's, it's the base idea. Um, the problem with these, though, is that we are going to very high dimensions. So these maps are 200 by 200 pixels, but in the future you might want to go to even bigger dimensions. So here, to address that, we are developing everything in TensorFlow uh, using the TPUs uh, developed by Google that have a lot of memory and that can handle a massive amount of data and do deep learning this way. All right, so the takeaway message on that part of my talk uh, was that um, we, this, this method is part of a broader class of laggy wood free inference and what is nice with these things is that we are shifting the physics from trying to model the signal um, and extracting the, a clean version of the signal to just putting everything on the simulation side and then we ask for a way to do inference just by having access to simulations. So the open challenges that I see with these kind of techniques nowadays um, is that we really want a, a way of training these methods that will uh, minimize the number of simulations that you need to sample in order to get a good accurate uh, estimate of your posterior. So one way of doing this is through some kind of active learning strategies where you get some first batch of simulations and that you can uh, introspect your estimate for the posterior and try to go back to ask for more simulations in the regions that actually matter. Um, and the next uh, big challenge that is actually a very active field in machine learning is to build flexible density estimators in high dimension. So that will allow you to do this density estimation task uh, in high dimension uh, space for the parameters. All right. So, okay. So the first example was an example at the, the image level. 
This one was at the inference level. And now I'm going to show you an example at the level of trying to understand the systematics in the signal. So for the people in the room who are familiar with uh, weak lensing, you know that it's actually a very complicated task to measure the gravitational lensing that happens when the light from background galaxies uh, goes through the universe and gets measured by an instrument, uh, blurred by uh, either the, the instrumental response or the atmosphere, or both, get pixelated and that noise. So you're trying to measure from those pixelated and noisy images those tiny deformation that comes from the gravitational lensing signal. Um, so we know nowadays that uh, when you try to do this task, no matter how hard you try, you will get some biases in your estimate for the gravitational lensing. So these biases usually take two forms, a multiplicative bias here and some additive bias over here. Um, the good news, though, is that you can try to calibrate those biases through simulations in order to clean out your signal and remove those systematics. But the question that you have to ask is how complex do your simulation need to be in order to uh, estimate those calibration factors to uh, the level of the requirements. So to show you an example of this uh, live in the wild, this is a set of simulations that we performed last year for the calibration of the HSC survey. Uh, and these are four generations of these simulations. And every time we increase the complexity of the simulation. So from very simple uh, parametric galaxies isolated at the center of their post edge stems to these very messy uh, set of simulations where uh, the galaxies are actually real galaxies taken from the Hubble Space Telescope and they are downgraded to the resolution of the instrument. So without going into too many details, um, this is a plot that shows you that if you look at how much the calibration factors change uh, for those several set of simulations, the changes can be significant. So it means that depending on the complexity of the simulations, uh, you will get different answers for your calibration factors. Um, and one reason for this is that the calibration that you would get uh, when you try to do this, this task on simulation depends on the details of the morphology of your galaxies. So let's say if you make your simulation with galaxies that are look realistic, uh, you will get a different answer than if you use simpler uh, approximations for what a galaxy looks like. And this is a plot that shows this uh, for the Great Street Challenge, where here you have um, the, um, the calibration factor for the parametric galaxies and the same ones uh, for the real galaxies. And each dot here is a shape measurement method that was entered in the challenge. So if the details of the galaxy morphology didn't matter at all, everything should lie on this line. But you can see that it actually does matter. And some methods are actually pretty biased when you change the type of galaxy models. All right, so this is an illustration here uh, that shows you that you actually need uh, data-driven generative models. So the problem is that we don't have a good or adequate physical model to describe all these galaxies here. Uh, we could simulate them, but it's extremely time-consuming. Um, oops. It's extremely time-consuming. So the question is, uh, can we learn from the signal itself a model of the data that we can then use for such a task, uh, for instance, for the, our calibration purposes? Um, and the answer is yes, and this is a field that is changing almost on a weekly basis in machine learning uh, called deep generative models. So back in 2006, this was uh, almost the best thing that you could get from a neural network. You could teach it to, to look at some examples of signals and learn the distribution of these signals and then produce more uh, examples of that distribution. So back in 20 2006, the best thing that you could do with such a method was to learn how digits look like and sample more digits. And then there was a significant shift in complexity of methods uh, within 2014. Uh, this type of algorithm where for the first time you could do something like drawing uh, faces. And around the same time there is another algorithm that people have uh, talked about a lot uh, called the generative adversarial network. So these uh, are pretty nice, they can capture very high fidelity uh, images. And that is the state of the art as of uh, uh, last year. These are not real people, these are people generated by a neural network after looking at enough examples of, of real faces. All right. 
So usually I do this, this uh, visual Turing test when I give this talk, where I have those two sets of images. Um, one set is real galaxy images, and the other one is fake images. And I usually ask people to decide which one is fake, uh, which one is not. And by now I know that uh, people cannot guess unless they have seen this talk before, so I'm gonna go to the answer. Um, the set on, on the left is actually completely fake. It's uh, sampled from this generative model called the Pixel CNN. And on the right, it's a set of real galaxies uh, from the SDSS. So what that tells you is that you are able to build very complex models of your signals and you can easily uh, draw from, from them, complex enough that they can uh, fool a human. All right, so I won't go into the details of how that particular model was built, but I can show you uh, how a very uh, similar algorithm uh, works. Um, I will quickly go through this thing called the auto-encoding uh, auto variational uh, based algorithm. So here the idea is that the, the signal is drawn from such a model where I have a set of uh, latent variable uh, Z, and from, from Z I can get, I can sample my X's and I have some distribution on, on Z itself. So the problem here um, is that you can, you can model this distribution as a function that depends on neural networks, but if you want to optimize those neural networks, you need to optimize with respect to this guy. And this is impractical or uh, intractable in most situations. So the idea of the, the variational autoencoder, and I'm gonna skip the details, is that uh, you can do this by using a two-step two uh, neural network architecture. A first uh, module of your network is called an inference network, and what it does is it looks at an example of an image, and from that example, it tries to guess what is the posterior distribution of this signal inside uh, this, the space of the latent variables. And by doing that, it allows you to train the next, the next bit of the network that this time takes a point in the latent space and maps it back to uh, an image. So without going into too much details, this is the idea of this is how this is trained. You show an image and you ask to reconstruct the same image uh, and you, you minimize a loss function that looks like this, where here you ask the, 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 the representation of the signal to be close to the prior that you want and you want uh, your reconstruction to be close to the, the input signal. Um, and to show you that uh, this work, this is an example that we published uh, last year on Hubble's, Hubble Space Telescope images. This is a set of real images. These images are generated by our model. Um, and the nice thing with our model is that we can also make it conditional. So we can sample, for instance, galaxies of given size, uh, given brightness, and it will sample uh, objects uh, that are not biased. Um, and you can also check whether or not the, the model that he learns is actually more complex than a simple parametric model for the galaxy images. So at the top here you have real Cosmos images. Um, in the middle you have samples that are drawn from our convolutional, uh, our variational to encoder architecture. And at, the, at the, the bottom these are fits to these images with a simple parametric uh, fit. And we can look at some summary statistics that look at the morphology of these objects. And you get uh, something like this if you look at those two morphology statistics, Gini and M20. Um, this is a distribution of real Cosmos images that you would get. And this is a distribution that you would get from the parametric models. So you see that there is an overdensity of galaxies in these regions or an underdensity in here. And it's interesting because here this region actually uh, is where you would expect the more uh, disturbed morphologies look like. So it, it shows you visually that your parametric model that people have used for a long time for modeling galaxy images is um, too simple. But if you use sample from, from our method, you can see that this discrepancy goes away and you are actually able to generate those uh, more disturbed uh, morphologies. All right, so the takeaway message here is that um, this is a data-driven way of completing our physical modeling and by that I mean Whenever we don't have a good model for a signal, we can just extract it from this, the data itself. Uh, we are implementing, as we speak, this approach inside the Galsim software so that it will be available to everybody. Um, and we are going to use it in the next generation of simulations for LSST. Um, at the end of the day, it will be an essential tool for the calibration of the science pipeline, 
not only uh, for the shear, but for uh, measuring photometries and deblending and all these kind of things that depend on the details of how Galaxy look like. All right. Um, yes. And with that, I'm going to skip my entire last section and go to the conclusion. Ask me about graphs if you're interested afterwards. Um, yes, and I'll go to my conclusion. So what can I think deep learning can do for cosmology? Um, one important aspect of this is it, can, it's an, it opens new and powerful ways to look at the data. So for instance, uh, extracting great national lenses, we didn't have a good way of doing this at scale. Um, we can use it for exploring new strategies for doing our inference, so not just at the lower level of the analysis, but all the way uh, to the, the cosmological inference. Um, and one very interesting aspect of this method is that we are in, in uh, you know, the, the uh, realm of being able to learn uh, from the data itself models for the signals when these signals are too complicated to come up from first principles. And with that, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you.